Margaret, you're a performing artist known for using unconventional instruments. And you're also the first professional toy piano player in the whole world. What is one word that best describes you? Quirkiness. Why? Well, I like to think that I have transformed quirkiness into an art form. Artist Margaret Leng Tang was born in Singapore, where she started learning classical music at age six. And in 1971, she became the first woman to earn a doctorate at Juilliard, where she studied piano performance. In the 90s, Margaret changed gears and began to make a name for herself as a modern toy piano virtuoso after meeting the pioneer composer and artist John Cage, who collaborated with her musically for more than a decade, influencing her deeply. He studied Indian philosophy, he uh, was influenced by the Chinese Book of Changes and very importantly, the way of Zen. So I thought, what better way of, you know, um, letting Asian audiences realize how much an impact their culture, Asian culture in general, and particularly, you know, these three cultures I mentioned, have had an impact on, on some great minds of the West. Absolutely. Is that something you still struggle with, the whole feeling like you're not doing something that's as helpful to others as you could be doing? That's a very good question. You see, then I met John Cage, you mm -hmm. see, and having met John Cage, um, not only did he give me a whole new way of looking at music, he also gave me a whole new approach to looking at life. You see, you cannot study just the music of John Cage without also knowing something about his way of thinking. It would be very superficial if you did. So having um, had this wonderful experience of working with him for 11 years from 1981 to his death in 1992, I learned a great deal from him also about how to approach life. And um, as far as the art goes, he didn't believe that the artist should be stranded in the ivory tower. He really believed that the artist should use his talents and um, use them for the good of others. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of his pieces, which is a performance piece that I like to do very much, it's basically a solo to be performed by anyone in any way mm -hmm. with these conditions attached. And one of the conditions was it mustn't be just playing a piece of music. Uh, another of the conditions, which that's the one that really struck me was, when you perform this piece, you fulfill your obligation in whole or in part towards others. I do that to call attention to certain animal rights causes that are very important to me. You see, art has to have some function outside of just the pure aesthetic beauty of it. For me, I, I, I feel for it to have its full meaning, it's got to carry over into the real world. Wow. Can you tell me a little bit more about your relationship with John Cage? Like you were saying, you guys were working together for about a decade, so he obviously influenced you personally very much. Very much musically. so. Musically. What was that relationship like that you had with him? Okay, um, let's just put it this way for starters, that I um, view my life um, in two different epochs, okay? Mm -hmm. um, AC and BC, after Cage, <laughs> after Cage and before wow. Cage, okay? It's that big. A divide for me. Ah. I, I see that. Um, and actually to me, I, I really shouldn't do this, but for me, BC isn't that important. <laughs> I shouldn't really negate my whole life. Up to <laughs> but I have a tendency to say, you know, what I did in the past really wasn't that, that important compared to what I did after I met him. When you come out of a strictly classical background, you come out of Juilliard, which is one of the most um, prestigious music schools in the world, but yeah. one of the most also highly competitive environments absolutely, in the world, absolutely. you know. Um, it does create a certain mindset. I mean, it's inevitable. If you're going to survive, you know, in, in that kind of environment, you, you have to, A, got to be quite 
tough. You, you have to stand up to criticism. And you also develop a competitive streak, just because that's the way the school is. You know? And I didn't particularly like that in me. Um, so with, with Cage, all that became really rather irrelevant. You know, because life for him really wasn't about competition. And it wasn't about goals and, and achieving great concrete uh, intentions. For him, it was more the process. And that is something which is very Zen, that the process is far more important than reaching the goal itself. So for me, <coughs> the process has become an increasingly fascinating one. And so whether I give a good concert or not, I am much less hard on myself because that's only part of this process of learning. The concert isn't the be all to end all. It's only part of this process. And to be honest, you learn more from a bad performance than you do from a good one. Yeah. Once you get beyond beating yourself over the head. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, you can learn a great deal from all the things that went wrong or didn't go quite as you expected because there's a reason for why those things happened and then you analyze it and then you, you fix them. John Cage defined error as merely our inability to adjust immediately from a preconception to an actuality. And wrong notes don't really matter. Absolutely. I've heard though that you are a big perfectionist that yes, you, I am. That you and, and How does that fit in? This is what I'm trying to come to terms with, this, this need to be perf a perfectionist. I'm much kinder to myself now than I used to be um, because of what Cage said. And there's also something else he said which has had a deep impact on me, which is this. The important questions are answered by not only liking, but disliking and accepting equally what one likes and what one dislikes. In 1948, John Cage wrote Suite for the Toy Piano, the first time ever and arguably the most famous instance that serious concert music was written specifically for the toy piano. Until then, the instrument was seen exclusively as an educational children's toy. If John Cage had not written his charming suite for toy piano in 1948, I don't think all this would have happened. But there again, you know, he wrote this delightful, whimsical piece as a dance piece for his partner, Merce Cunningham. Mm -hmm. uh, and the piece used only nine consecutive white notes so it, mm. on the toy piano. So that means that you could even, I suppose, play it on a toy piano with painted black keys, <laughs> you know, the kind Schroeder had. <laughs> <laughs> but what Cage did with those nine white notes, the, endless inventiveness and creativity of the permutations and patterns and rhythms he made out of this. He wrote a very challenging little piece. It was not easy. And to do it justice, you really, really had to practice it as hard as you would practice anything on, on, on the adult piano. Wow. Yeah. So after all that, that work on it, uh, on this little piano for $45 that I bought in a thrift shop, I thought to myself, this little instrument I think has the potential to become a rail instrument. So I set out to transform it into a rail instrument. And so I made arrangements of pieces that I thought would sound really good on the toy piano, like Philip Glass. <laughs> <laughs> sounds very good on the toy piano. Um, uh, Eric Satie sounds beautiful on the toy piano. And um, got my composer friends all excited about the toy piano because the sound is so magical. It's so seductively enchanting and takes you down a path of nostalgia, you know, uh, towards your childhood. So um, I got my composer friends very excited and they all fell in love with, with its sound and this spurred them on to 
unprecedented heights of creative frenzy. <laughs> and they started to write for toy piano, you know. So that's how I gradually amassed a repertoire. And um, before I knew it, people were giving me toy pianos, you know. It was like this toy piano right here, this one in the middle here. Uh -huh. This is a rags to riches toy piano. It came from a Wisconsin barn sale. Wow. And the gentleman who had it, his children outgrew it, and he heard about me, and he sent it to me. Wow, that's and I, amazing. Is that amazing? And I only met him recently, a couple of months ago. After all these years, 20 years ago, he sent this piano to me. And this piano has been to Beethoven's house in Bonn. It's, it's, it's been on all the three stages of Carnegie Hall. It's been at Lincoln Center. It's, it just recently traveled to Australia with me. So it is a rags to riches <laughs> toy piano. As you just pointed out, you have gotten exceptional acceptance for an avant-garde musician trying something just new things and you got to perform at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center and get a very big following like the guy you know who why? sang the piano. You why? Know why? I can answer you that in one sentence. Yeah. This ain't no gimmick. That's why. It's if it was a gimmick it would have died a long time ago. You know, I wouldn't be bashing my head against the brick wall trying to make it sound good for 20 years. <laughs> Since the mid-90s, you know, if, if I wasn't seriously dedicated to transform it in, into a, a legitimate instrument that other people would respect as well. You've also changed basically the way that the audience interacts with music, the way that they experience a typical concert. Yes. You know why? Because uh, well, especially new music, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I, I kind of left my classical past behind me at this point, unless I happen to be doing some arrangement of a Beethoven sonata for a toy piano, mm -hmm. you know, as my ode to Schroeder. Um, but otherwise, basically, I'm, I'm playing brand new pieces that are made specially for the toy piano. So what I'm doing very subversively um, is getting audiences exposed to new music and loving new music rather than being terrified of it. Because, you know, modern music is very daunting to most audiences and they, and they, and they don't want to set foot inside a concert hall if they, they, they know it's going to be mostly modern music. Um, they say, well, I've not been trained to listen to this stuff. I, I, I can't appreciate it and so on and so forth. But with a toy piano, it's so seductive and it's so, it really wins people over. So, I've, so that before you know it, they've heard a whole concert of avant-garde music yeah. without realizing it, and, and on top of which they've really enjoyed themselves. The fact that I want to do on this toy what I can do on the big piano means several things. I have to get myself the best toy piano I possibly can. Um, and that happens to be these vintage Schoenhoods mm -hmm. that I have here. Uh, I have to work very, very hard to control this very primitive mechanism and work at it in a way that it, it can become something I can rely on, that I can recreate this kind of control in concert under nerves. And believe me, that has taken a tremendous amount of, of dedication and just sheer obsessiveness <laughs> you know, on my part. And I am obsessive by nature. That's what perfectionism is all about. And that's what John Cage really has helped me a great deal to, to look at this particular aspect of my personality in a kind of way where I can, through application of, of Zen, uh, temper it a little bit. I'll never be rid of it completely, but I at least can temper it a bit. After 20 years, I can actually boast to you when I say, and I mean it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that anything I can do on the regular piano, I can do on the toy piano in terms of control and um, different kinds of touch and nuance and subtlety. I can do it on the toy now. Wow. And that has made me an even better pianist on the normal piano when I go back to it. How often do you go back to it? I go back to it um, when I work on Cage's music. Mm -hmm. Mm. And sometimes I play pieces where I combine the toy piano 
oh. and the adult piano together. Um, there's some beautiful, beautiful pieces written for me by Toby Twining for my first album, The Art of the Toy Piano. Wow. And um, th that combination is really very, very special. Last month, at the Young Cage Toy Piano Festival, Margaret performed selections of Curious, a six-act multimedia piece commissioned by the Singapore Arts Festival and composed by Phyllis Chen in celebration of Margaret's 70th birthday. Phyllis was inspired by a picture of two clowns from the 1920s that Margaret had shared with her. The complete piece premiered in August of last year, and Margaret is now working on bringing it here to New York. It's multimedia because it has video and lighting and masks and it uses toy pianos, toy instruments and invented instruments. We even had Ranjit Batnaga, wh whom I call our inventor in residence, mm -hmm. <laughs> as part of this project. You know, so this work um, was highly acclaimed when I performed it in Singapore and it was so special because um, it's based on, on the circus carnival. Of, from a picture of three clowns <laughs> that I had given her that was so haunting and so grotesque that we were both <laughs> unable to forget it. And she created this piece inspired by this image of the circus. And it's, it's got the surface gaiety, it's got tremendous amount of pathos and, and very, very dark mixed emotions and melancholy. She created such deep, profound emotions, it's easier to hear them in the music than to try and convey it in words. And I'm never short of words, <laughs> so you can imagine. You know, it's, it's a very, very special creation. I hope that when I eventually do premiere it in the States, that we can um, submit it as a candidate for the Pulitzer Prize, because I think she deserves wow. a great recognition for having created this extraordinary work. And at the Uncaged Festival, I did a couple of teaser excerpts from this, this work, um, which I enjoyed doing very much. I think the audience was very moved by it because um, it's from the heart. And she knows me very well for this. And she gave me, in this piece, Curios, the chance to explore my acting abilities. She left me spaces in the piece for me to just express myself theatrically. And, you know, coming out of the music, it was so natural to me to do certain things. First of all, we had masks made for us by Stanley Alan Sherman, who's a wonderful mask maker. Mm. And in this, one of the movements I played for Phyllis's Uncaged Festival, I wore a clown nose. Mm -hmm. And when you wear a mask, you become someone else. You are still you, but you're also some, you know, you, you, you are now somebody, you're another persona. Mm -hmm. So wearing this clown nose, and I don't have any embarrassment or any self-consciousness about playing the toy piano wearing a clown nose, because I believe so deeply and profoundly in the validity of her piece. So there's no two ways about it. I will wear my clown nose with pride, okay? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm playing with bicycle horns, I'm hitting myself on the head with a plastic hammer, all these things that clowns do, you know? And I did it so spontaneously coming out of the music, it was so organic, nothing was contrived or just added in, that I really do believe that if you are 100% convinced yourself of the integrity of what you're doing, you can convince other people as well. And nobody will accuse you of making a gimmick. And I think that's the, the, the story behind my toy piano. As I said earlier, never, never have I ever been accused of resorting to gimmickry yeah. or, or cheap tricks. Absolutely. Do you, are you currently involved with any similar festivals or do you plan on having any upcoming performances or different compositions? What are you working on right now? 
Okay, there's two things I'm working on now. I've absolutely got to finish the editing on my Art of the Thai Piano mm -hmm. um, Volume 3, oh. which is called Clangor, after a piece by the Canadian composer Monica Pierce for Three Bicycle Bells and Toy Piano. Yes, uh, I have to finish the editing on that because it's been a long time since Volume 2 came out and an even longer time since Volume 1 came out. Volume 1, uh, the Art of the Toy Piano, uh -huh. the initial one, came out in 1997. Wow. Yeah. And and you know, that's what established the toy piano. Absolutely. Uh, because it got incredible amount of media attention. Everything from Newsweek to CNN to all things considered on NPR, everybody was interested in this very unique album. So that really launched the toy piano Absolutely. into people's consciousness. Yeah, so it's time for me to follow up with my third album. The other thing that, um, in terms of the performance field, I'm very excited about this, is that the Singapore Art Biennale, mm -hmm. which will be happening this coming year, 2016, in the autumn, has asked me to be part of it. And to me, that is exactly what I want. Because now I've established myself not only as a toy pianist, first of all, as a pianist, yes. and then as a toy pianist, uh, as a performance artist, as a, um, a multi-toy instrumentalist, a multimedia artist, um, that I can act, oh, and I can also sing. Oh. <laughs> yes, I also have a great connection with artists. And so John Cage had a great connection with artists. All his friends were artists, not musicians. They were artists or writers or dancers, but not so much musicians. And I'm very close to many artists uh, and many museums have invited me to participate in exhibitions because of my connection with Cage, because he was also a visual artist. And the fact that his ideas had such a profound influence on artists mm -hmm. means that um, People um, often pay tribute to him, you know, in other contexts besides music. Yeah, because he really was a, a truly Renaissance man. So the Singapore Biennale has asked me to be part of this upcoming Biennale, and I'm absolutely thrilled. And what I'd like to do is do a joint collaboration um, with Eric Griswold, an Australian art, uh, musician and installation sound artist. You see again the word sound art, uh -huh. that's only possible because of John Cage. The, the genre wouldn't even exist if it wasn't mm -hmm. because of John Cage. So I, 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 I want to work with them on a collaboration on that. And I also want to be able to um, give a performance at the Biennale uh, showing the connection between art and music. Oh, perfect. So there's lots of things I still want to do before I retire. <laughs> <laughs> You don't need to retire anyway, so... As long as I have still got the energy to drag my toy pianos around the world, I'll keep going for a little longer. <laughs>